The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt him back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 37 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we're taking a look at Avengers number 34, The Living Laser. This issue is written by Stan Lee, art by Don Heck, and letters by Art Simic, and it comes to us in November of 1966. Taking a look at our cover this week, while I really enjoy the art on the cover, it looks really, really nice, I am a little disappointed that it's still very Goliath-centric. The fact that we are still fairly focused on Goliath as a character, I don't want to say to the detriment of the team, but certainly I think he's taking up more of the team's focus than is necessary, and the last number of covers have really shown that. Additionally, he's a bit out of proportion. As someone who's supposed to be 10 feet tall, I would expect the other Avengers, Captain America, Hawkeye, to come up to maybe his elbow, maybe mid-torso, mid-chest area, and instead they come up to maybe his thigh. Hawkeye's in a very awkward position coming up just underneath Goliath's crotch, so there's also that. But the proportion problem aside, it's a really nice looking cover. Now our opening splash page is certainly not the best splash page I've ever seen, but it does start off with a good old fashioned bank heist, which as you guys are well aware, I'm a bit of a sucker for tropes like this. And so I at least enjoy the story that's going on, even if the splash page isn't blowing me away. So as I mentioned, the issue starts with the living laser breaking into a bank vault, and he is under the assumption that the police will not arrive for several minutes, but unfortunately for the living laser, there happens to be a patrol of police nearby, and so they arrive almost immediately. And the police here are entertainingly cliche. The first thing they want to do is surround the block, and then the next thing they do is demand that the person in question, in this case the living laser, come out with his hands up. It's so 1960s corny. And it's not a bad thing per se, but it is relying heavily on stereotypes. They also only give him 30 seconds to come out before they smash the door in and go into the bank themselves, only to find that the culprit has escaped through a hole in the ceiling. Now, oddly enough, as the living laser is kind of bragging to himself about how he was able to get away, he actually throws the pack of bonds he stole back down to the street, basically back at the police, because he doesn't need them. His purpose was not strictly to rob the bank for the money. His purpose was to rob the bank to prove that he could do it. And this is interesting, as we will see when we dive a little bit deeper into the Living Laser's character, you'll understand why he's doing the things that he's doing and why he doesn't care about the money. Now that we've introduced our villain, we will cut to the Avengers, who are just wrapping up a meeting, and they're deciding that it's time to take a little bit of a breather. They had a particularly tough couple of issues with the Sons of the Serpent, so they've decided that it's time to take a little bit of relaxation and reset themselves a little bit. So just as they are wrapping up their meeting, which, interestingly enough, Goliath is the acting chairman for the meeting. And again, I'm not a huge fan of the Avengers stepping backwards in this fashion, that yes, the democratic idea was really great at the time. However, the Avengers really benefit from a strong, specific leader, i.e. Captain America. And trying to go back to this rotating chairmanship, I think is detrimental to the team's ability to function. But as I was saying, just as Goliath is adjourning the meeting, the Avengers get an alarm, which turns out to be from this bank robbery. Now, Hawkeye is a little put out that the Avengers are going to go address this bank robbery. And he's corrected by Wasp, says, we can't always battle to save the world from power mad supervillains. And I tend to agree with Wasp. This is back in the days before teams like the Defenders, or at least the modern concept of the Defenders, who are a street level kind of team where the Avengers really deal with the higher level threats. But to me, this takes superheroes back towards their origins. And back in the 
the days of the 1930s when Batman and Superman went after slum lords and guys who beat their wives and they really were I think to an extent a more personal superhero if you will they dealt with things that were much closer to the individual person as opposed to Galactus or Kang or any number of world threatening universe threatening kind of problems they dealt with things that people in the 1930s dealt with all the time so this to me harkens back to that idea that the Avengers are here to serve at any level of assistance required so the Avengers jump in their aero car which again another form of transportation although to be fair in the next couple of issues we will see the aero car repeatedly so they have that going for them they don't decide to swap out modes of transportation on a issue by issue basis though also to be fair they do kind of wreck one of them so but the, again, the Avengers take their aero car and they head to this bank robbery, which it's interesting to the Avengers because it's a little bit more than just the standard bank robbery. Obviously, as we saw in the opening panel, the living laser is actually cutting through the vault and then cuts through the ceiling. So this is not something that the police are overly familiar with. Now, one of the things that gets me here, and it really is key to the entire story, is that while the Avengers are investigating this bank robbery, Wasp is recognized by a friend of hers named Lucy Barton. Now, as far as I know, Lucy has no relation to Hawkeye, obviously with the same last name, but I'm really kind of at a loss for words as to what happened to secret identities here. In general, Wasp is very much out of, say, out of costume, out of disguise. She's in her costume, but she has on no cowl, no face mask, nothing. So it, it is very easy to identify her, and her friend Lucy picks up on it almost immediately. And as we discover, Lucy is engaged to the son of the president of the bank, having recently broke off a relationship with a researched physicist named Arthur Parks, who we see actually kind of creeping on the scene here. He's looking through the window and we get a great panel of Arthur really looking like he's creeping in kind of a yellow and, and shadowed panel. I really like the panel. Arthur has been pining after Lucy, but as he's looking through this window and he sees Lucy talking to Janet, he instantly falls in love with Janet, falls in love with Wasp. And as we discover, Arthur is in fact our villain here. He is the living laser. Now, I'm really interested in Arthur as a character here. So, like I mentioned, Arthur is a research physicist and he is an expert on lasers. That's kind of obvious based on what he chose as his villainous alter ego. Now, what is a laser? Let's start there. So laser is actually an acronym and it is short for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. And lasers were fairly new in the 1960s. It's one of the things I actually really like about Stanley and Marvel Comics in the 1960s is that they tend to be on top of science and cutting technology. They don't obviously get it right very often. I mean, Stanley uses of radiation are kind of ridiculous but the fact that he takes these ideas and tries to incorporate them into the books really interests me the fact that he doesn't get them right is that's a different story but the first lasers were only invented in 1960 and it's based on research that, that really came around from the mid to late 1950s so about seven or eight years worth of work from really theoretical to physical execution of lasers. So Arthur is really on the cutting edge of science in the 1960s. It also tells me that Arthur is a very intelligent man. And as is often the case, very intelligent individuals are also kind of troubled or haunted individuals. And we get that sense from Arthur. Arthur goes home after seeing Wasp and we start to hear his internal monologue. And there is a definite descent into madness, some kind of obsessive mental illness that obviously started earlier with his obsession with Lucy but has now been transferred to Wasp and it's really fascinating to watch Arthur kind of fall down this rabbit hole. As I mentioned, Arthur is obsessed with Wasp, so he needs to figure out a way to win Wasp over and he decides that the way he's going to do that is by defeating Goliath and proving how powerful a man he is. 
back at Avengers Mansion, the team is going through a number of different training exercises. Now, the training regime here also gives us some insight into the team dynamic in that Captain America and Hawkeye are working very closely together and Goliath is nearby, but he's really off doing his own thing, doing huge weightlifting. It actually reminds me of an old Planet Fitness commercial and they had a, a big muscle bound guy and the, the Planet Fitness rep is trying to talk to him about the gym and just things in general and the guy's only response is I pick things up and put them down I pick things up and put them down and that's kind of what Goliath is doing here because he's just got one giant dumbbell that he just keeps picking up and putting down but Goliath's distance here and his lack of integrated training with the team really demonstrates the fact that Goliath isn't fully incorporated into the team in the way that Hawkeye and Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch have become. Now some of that is just his long absence and the fact that the team has changed while he was gone but some of that is also I don't know if we call it by choice but certainly by attitude Goliath has a very specific mental image of how the Avengers should work and that doesn't necessarily mesh with the reality of the team anymore and I think he struggles to change that mental model and adapt and be a better part of the team now unfortunately that also because of her closeness to Goliath means that Wasp also struggles to fully incorporate into the team. Now, I think that's going to change over time, especially with Wasp, but at least currently, there is certainly a deleterious effect. Now, since everybody knows where the Avengers Mansion is, because frequently people just randomly show up and attack the Avengers there, because they have a sketchy security system at best, the Living Laser is hanging out nearby where he can see Avengers Mansion, and he can tell when Goliath and Wasp leave, so he follows them. And where Goliath and Wasp end up is Hank Pym's laboratory, where we run into Bill Foster. Now, I am super excited to have seen Bill Foster again in this issue. Obviously, I know that Bill Foster is a recurring character because Bill Foster will eventually take over the mantle of Goliath from Hank Pym. But in the context of the 1960s and when this issue was actually released, there was a very real possibility that Bill Foster was effectively a one and done character. Really, a two issues, but one storyline, and then he could have just as easily never shown back up. So the fact that when Goliath shows up at the laboratory, here's Bill, and he's excited to see Goliath again, I really like that, and I think it brings some much-needed diversity to the Avengers. Not necessarily the team, because again, Bill's a part of the team at this point, but certainly to the book as a whole. Now, the one thing I don't like about this sequence is that Bill apologizes to Goliath. And while I am not strictly opposed to the idea of Bill apologizing to Goliath, Goliath doesn't also apologize, which I think is deserved. If Bill wants to apologize, that's fine, because Bill did kind of blow up at Goliath. Bill, however, is also owed an apology because Goliath intentionally kept a lot of information from Bill. Now, to be fair, if Goliath had clued in Bill, there would have been some level of risk. However, after what Bill had been through at the hands of the serpents, I find it really unlikely that he would have sided with the serpents. If anything, I think Bill is probably the more wronged party. Although Bill lost his temper at Goliath, based on the information that Bill had, it was a justifiable feeling. The fact that Goliath kept things from Bill, although a safety and a call it mission security argument could be made. The reality is the risk of Bill taking that information to the Sons of the Serpent or that information coming back to bite Goliath was really pretty low. But again, I am really glad to see Bill Foster return to Avengers. So as Bill and Goliath are reuniting, the living laser quietly bores a hole in the roof of the building and watches what's going on. And as the two biochemists get to work, Janet decides that she is going to go off and get her hair done, leaving the two men alone, at which point the living laser strikes and pretty quickly starts demolishing a significant portion of the laboratory. Goliath does his best to fend off the living laser and tells Bill to run away because for all that Bill wants to help, this is a situation where having no powers of his own, he really is pretty 
helpless and pretty vulnerable. So it makes sense for Goliath to try and get Bill to run to safety. Now, the fight between the Living Laser and Goliath, while they are inside the laboratory, is not overly impressive. Where things take a turn here, though, is that Goliath, thinking rather tactically, crashes through a wall and takes the fight outside, where he's no longer constrained by the physical limitations of the laboratory, right? He's a guy who's 10 feet tall and he's trying to fight inside a building, inside a laboratory. Unfortunately for Goliath, that just doesn't work out very well. But I really like the fact that he recognizes this and takes action to put the odds more evenly matched. And once he's outside, he makes really effective use of the extra freedom he has and everything that's available to him. He pins the living laser to a tree by his cape. He then uses a huge mound of dirt to cloud the living laser's vision so he can't shoot. When the living laser eventually gets free, he swings down from a tree and grabs him and takes him down. He uses everything that's there to the best of its ability, the best of his ability, and it's a brilliant decision on his to change the conditions of the fight. Now, through this whole thing, the living laser just will not stop running his mouth, and all I can think of is the scene from The Incredibles when Mr. Incredible's fighting Synapse for the first time, and suddenly Synapse stops and goes, you sly dog, you got me monologuing! I mean, that's, that's what the living laser's doing, and it doesn't work out for him. Although Bill Foster ran away a little bit, he didn't run very far. So once Goliath has finished with the living laser, he is able to go and summon the rest of the Avengers who come to back up Goliath. And Captain America and Hawkeye come and take the living laser into custody while Bill and Goliath go back to their work. Though I'm not exactly sure how because their lab was severely trashed. But at any rate, as Captain America and Hawkeye are escorting the living laser to i guess the authorities it's a little unclear as to where exactly they're taking him the living laser regains consciousness and blasts his way out the bottom of the avengers arrow car which brings me back to the idea of why nobody in the marvel universe thinks to strip villains of their equipment when they're taking into custody. Back in Avengers, it's either 15 or 16, where the Masters of Evil reunite after the death of Baron Zemo. It may actually even be a later issue than that. But we find Black Knight and the Melter still in their full costumes. Although Black Knight doesn't have his lance, he doesn't have his weapons. Like, Melter still got his equipment, and I don't understand why. You know, the argument then was, oh, they want to send some guys from Washington to study the villain's equipment. But it's like, can you not do that without them? Like, do they have to be wearing it for that? It doesn't make any sense. And again, here, the living laser wouldn't be able to punch his way out of this aerojet if it weren't for the fact that they left all of his equipment on. And guess what? Because of this, the Avengers end up crashing their aero car. All that money and all that hard work that Tony Stark put into this car and they just crash it. It's really inconsiderate of them. Now, in addition to the demise of the aero car, we get to see Captain America and Hawkeye working together a bit more outside of their training regime. And it shows me that Cap and Hawkeye have really developed a very tight and close working relationship that the previous iteration of the Avengers really lacked and again I really want to see Goliath become a part of this closeness among the team but right now scenes like this further emphasize the idea that Goliath is separate from the team. After his escape we start to see Arthur Park's spiral even further downward and really what started as him dressing up and developing these weapons to screw over the guy who's marrying his ex-girlfriend has now spilled over into this feud and vendetta against the avengers whatever's going on with arthur here it's obvious that he has no concept that he is doubling down on a bad idea and that he has really lost control of the situation it's one thing to want to take vengeance against someone who arthur doesn't really have a personal beef with not really not justifiably but someone who i think we can all understand why arthur might want to take action against him to the Avengers who Arthur really has no legitimate problems with until he makes them for himself. Now as part of this downward spiral we see Arthur attacking a large number of 
targets. And I think what's going on here is that we are actually seeing the comics code, or at least the fear of the comics code, in action. Arthur attacks a building, an airport, and a ship. And in all three instances, the dialogue makes it very clear that it was an abandoned building, it was planes that didn't have any passengers on them that were going overseas, and that the ship was going to be a target ship, a dummy ship. And it strikes me that the reality of what was intended here is to make the living laser a very serious public threat that fits with his downward spiral in his mental state and the fact that he wants to more actively engage the Avengers. Right? Destroying a building, destroying planes with passengers, and sinking a ship, all of these things would draw the attention of the Avengers, let alone all of them combined. But the dialogue insisting that effectively nobody is hurt and that he's running around kind of being a nuisance really undermines the actions that the living laser is taking and again i think it's either it was a edit by the code or a fear of edits by the comics code that prompted them to put those boxes of dialogue in to lessen the sting of the actions that the living laser is taking so with everything that's going on the avengers have now gone out to actively look for the living laser and see if they can't find him before he strikes again so we see captain america and hawkeye out on their jet scooters which are really cool little pieces of technology i really do in fact like them i was hoping that we would get to see more of them after the first time when Goliath used it to get to South America, and I'm glad to see they've made a return. But eventually, Hawkeye and Captain America see the living laser taking pop shots at a bridge and causing traffic mayhem. Now, in the living laser's defense, having lived in New York City, it does not take much to cause traffic mayhem. At one point, I was trying to come home from Pennsylvania, and a watermelon truck rolled over on the Tappan Zee Bridge. And long story short was I sat in traffic for almost three hours trying to go less than a mile getting across the George Washington Bridge because a watermelon truck flipped. It was one of the worst traffic experiences I have ever had in my life, all because of a watermelon truck. So the traffic here, the problem that are being caused maybe they're from the living laser maybe they're not maybe he's just taking advantage of stopped cars and taking little pop shots at them but at any rate captain america and hawkeye figure out which building the shots are coming from they chase the living laser into the basement of the building only to be trapped behind a series of laser bars now captain america has treated his shield in a laser reflecting or deflecting coating that is recommended to him by Tony Stark, but it's only got a short life. And when Hawkeye and Captain America are imprisoned behind these bars, it's after Cap has already deflected several shots from the living laser. So he's unsure if his shield will be able to take any more at this point, Hawkeye and Captain America are effectively trapped. Once again, the living laser gives us some more monologuing, although it's a really cool panel with the yellows and greens here that I really like. It's reminiscent of the first panel that we saw Arthur Parks in, but there where he's looking like a lot more of a creep, this one he really looks like he's more in control of the situation. So there's that change in character there from guy who's not really in control of the situation and not necessarily comfortable with what he's doing to men who has descended further into madness, thinks he's in control of the situation, and is very comfortable with what he's doing. Now, in addition to Hawkeye and Captain America looking for the living laser, Wasp has also been on the lookout for living laser. So when Cap and Hawkeye locate him, Wasp is not far behind, and just as Arthur Parks is finishing his monologuing, Wasp shows up to attempt to free her teammates, only to be captured in a mason jar and taken off with the living laser. And as punishment and frustration for her actions, the living laser flips a switch, causing the laser bars to slowly change their angle and creep inward on Captain America and Hawkeye, eventually leading to their inevitable deaths. However, this is where we will leave the issue. Now, the last thing I want to talk about from the issue here, before I talk about my, my final thoughts, is that I'm getting a little tired of the wasp-in-a-jar trope. We 
we've used it several times now. It's a little obvious because of the name Wasp and Bugs in a Jar, and we're just using it a little too often. I think we've established pretty clearly that I enjoy tropes when they're not overused and when they're done well, and this one's getting to a point where it's getting both overused and not done very well anymore. So hopefully we can step away from this trope for a little bit and then return to it once we've given it some time. So overall, I really find Arthur Parks to be certainly an interesting character, and honestly, I find him to be a bit sympathetic, certainly more sympathetic than some of our previous villains. I know I can personally relate to, and I think a lot of people can, the feelings of frustration that Arthur feels for unrequited love. Now, obviously, I have never decided to take that to the supervillain route and harass the people who are the paramours of my unrequited love, but also, to be fair, I don't really have the same skill set that Parks has, so my supervillainy would be pretty lame. I also feel like he's a little bit of a different villain, at least initially, because he has and wants nothing to do with the Avengers. Most of the villains that we have encountered, in some way, shape, or form, are taking action against the Avengers because of something one of their particular members has done. I think the other exception to this has probably been Swordsman, who is really doing it strictly for his own personal gain and ego. But if you look back at, say, the Masters of Evil, where each of the Masters of Evil have joined that team because they want revenge on a particular Avenger. Arthur Parks isn't initially obsessed with getting back at the Avengers for things they have done to him in the past. Instead, he has this obsession with Lucy Barton, which then becomes this obsession with Wasp, and that finally in turn drives him into conflict with the Avengers. There's an interesting and almost relatable aspect of mental illness that couples with the obsession that Park exhibits. And again, I think that makes him a very sympathetic and very interesting and somewhat relatable villain. And again, different than we've seen before. Different is good. I, I love to see new and different and unique characters and villains enter into these stories so that it's not the same thing every time. And I think Arthur Parks helps to make things different in this issue. Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, send your questions and comments to Andrew at AvengersAssembly.com. Next week, we're going to be taking a look at Avengers number 35, The Light That Faded. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.